If we want to industrialize the moon, then we're going to need to use heavy machines, either automated or teleoperated from Earth, and we're going to need to use lots of them, which means we'll need to mass produce them, which means they need to be designed simply and made from local lunar resources. So that's what we'll do in this video, design a general fleet of robotic lunar construction vehicles. And in doing so, I hope to challenge a lot of preconceived notions and assumptions about what lunar development might look like, what strategies and practices are optimal, and why future space age technology might look more like it belongs in the 1950s than in the 2050s. There's already about 7 sextillion kilograms of usable mass in orbit around the Earth. Our ancestors dubbed this giant ball of stuff the moon, but I think we should just start referring to it as the giant ball of feedstock material orbiting Earth. But in order to actually use this moon material, to mold it into ships and stations, we have to slap an economy on it, and the best way to kickstart an economy is to build some buildings, host some tourists, sell some real estate, make some profit. This way we won't require a blank check from Congress to get started developing the moon. We can fund our own expansion beyond Earth using the awe-inspiring power of the free market. But all this, and I mean everything, is dependent on the ability to dig holes on the moon. First, these all-important buildings need to be buried under at least 3 meters of regolith to protect their inhabitants from radiation. These are buried bunkers, fallout shelters, not Levittown homes. And we can build these buildings out of steel or ferrochrome by melting lunar regolith into electrolysis reactors. But to do that, we need to feed these reactors regolith scooped up from across the lunar surface. Even if you're able to turn on creative mode and skip the whole building a viable lunar economy off the back of tourism and habitable real estate step, and you instead jump straight to building spacecraft and stations and mass drivers, Dyson swarms, and orbital rings, you gotta build them out of something. And that something is the moon itself. Metric tons of it. Lunar regolith turned iron, steel, aluminum. And to do that, you gotta scoop it up and melt it, separate it, mold it, manufacture it. So we need digging and scraping machines to chip away at our giant ball of usable mass, breaking it apart into usable chunks. We need to design a lunar excavator. The first machines will need to be imported. They'll need to be smaller to fit into a rocket, and they'll likely use lithium ion batteries for power. We aren't talking about designing the first machines to reach the moon, but rather the first generation of machines mostly made on the moon, out of the moon. This is after a base is established. This is what comes next. So with that long meandering intro out of the way, let's discuss the Flintstones to Ferrari scale. This scale is meant to represent a range of possibilities according to technical complexity. On the Flintstones end, you have very simple rudimentary technology that is easy to make and easy to repair and rarely breaks, but is typically bulky and imprecise. On the other side we have, well, Ferraris. Technically complex, lots of little interworking precise components, extremely involved manufacturing, lots of shit goes into it. Things on this end of the scale often perform extremely well, maximizing efficiencies to the greatest degree, but are also often sort of fragile and require a lot of upkeep outside of the already large manufacturing requirements. And on the moon, for almost everything, we need to deviate towards the Flintstones because we are essentially bootstrapping a civilization from scratch. The more complex and involved a production process is, the more imports we'll need to manufacture it, or to set up its production line. The more imports we need, the greater the cost, and the lower our growth rate, the higher the chances of failure, the less staying power we have. So, somewhat counterintuitively, in undertaking one of the most advanced projects our hyper-specialized, efficiency-maximizing modern civilization can, in attempting to develop the moon, we need to go in the opposite direction with our production and steer towards less efficient, very robust, easy to manufacture and repair products, whether that be shelters or ships or rovers. On the lowest end of the Flintstone scale, the frame or chassis of the vehicle could be made out of centered blocks of lunar regolith, 
basically basalt stone blocks, so it would actually be quite like the literal Flintstones car. But I think it makes a lot more sense to make the frame or body of our vehicle out of steel. Why use steel? Because you'll want to use steel for shelters. Why use it for shelters? Safety. Or the perception of safety. You want your customers to feel safe, to know they're safe, whether they're tourists or a government agency or a private company or a wealthy individual wanting a lunar retreat. Safety is key. It also just makes sense given steel's thermal properties and ductility. Same reason we build buildings out of it today. Again, we're building vault tech bunkers, not sprawling suburbs. Would you build a bunker or a submarine out of aluminum? Technically, you could make your shelters out of sodium crystals. It's sort of abundant on the moon, but why? Steel is strong, robust, safe, easy to work with, easily made from lunar regolith, and its material properties are ideal for the fluctuating thermal environment of both the moon and space. The biggest limitation is you'll need to import carbon from the earth or elsewhere to make steel, adding it to the molten ferrochrome made when melting regolith. So it has that as a constraint, but if you really, really don't want to import carbon, you can still get away with using ferrochrome itself although it would likely be more brittle, like white cast iron. But again, carbon can be made from astronaut poop, and that has to go somewhere. You're literally importing carbon when you import food, which you have to do anyway, although this is a terribly inefficient way of importing carbon. All right, the next thing we need to figure out is how big this vehicle should be. What size is optimal? And like our Flintstones to Ferrari complexity scale, I present the lawnmower to mining truck size scale. Should we aim to make a Bella 75710 sized vehicle or should it be smaller, the size of a lawnmower? What about something in between those two extremes like the size of a truck or a smart car? Well, are we mowing lawns or excavating a celestial body? In general, when it comes to earthworking activities, uh, moon working in our case, bigger is better for three reasons. First, rough terrain, boulders, crevices, craters. The lunarscape isn't neat. It's rugged, rough, complex, dusty, which makes it a big challenge for little wheels. Larger wheels are better, but you can put large wheels on a small vehicle. So why else should our vehicle be big? Well, for the same reason, larger lawn mowers mow lawns faster and larger excavators excavate faster and larger rockets have a lower cost per kilogram to low earth orbit. Scale. You get more bang per your buck. You get more metric meters moved per part and bigger vehicles exert more force, which leads me to my final point as to why larger is better. Lever action counterweight. Because of the square cube law, things get heavier faster than they get stronger. That's why we don't have 40 foot spiders and Earth's largest animals are ocean dwelling, where buoyancy makes being heavy less metabolically costly. But we're operating in one sixth of the gravity of Earth, and so we actually want to get bigger to get heavier, because the vehicle will need to use its own weight to leverage a force against the regolith it is scooping up. Sure, the regolith also weighs one sixth what it would on Earth, so everything evens out, but what about moving boulders? Breaking through all those subsurface moon roots from the now extinct lunar trees? The larger a vehicle is, the more force it can leverage against a load. The more it can gather per scoop, the less it has to worry about rolling over boulders or getting stuck in loose regolith. So, all in all, Little excavators only really make sense if you're shipping them to the moon on rockets. But if you're making them on the moon, then bigger is better. But we still haven't answered our original question of approximately how big should these things be. On Earth, vehicles are built around humans, except in the US where they're built around ego. But even then, they have a metric to aim for, a reason to be a certain size. But what about the largest vehicle in the world, the Belaz 75710? Why is it that big and not bigger? Why stop there? Well, its limiting factor is its tires. Rubber tires are scaled up about as big as they can be. The speed at which haulers can move is limited by centrifugal forces. Massive, heavy tires want to rip themselves apart when they spin quickly. And I guess that brings up another question. 
Are we using wheels or tracks? Obviously, we're not going to use rubber tires, but both wheels and tracks can be made out of steel. So what are the trade-offs? Most excavators on Earth use tracks, but most rovers use wheels. And this is because wheels can be made very light. These rovers are launched on rockets after all and have lower density power sources. Lightweight wheels save on launch costs and are easier to move with less power. Tracks are heavy. But since we're making this thing on the moon, we can get away with being heavy. And like we noted previously, we actually want to increase the weight. Heavier is better, right? But the issue with tracks is their complexity. They're harder to manufacture and assemble and especially hard to repair, typically requiring an entire crew, whereas a wheel can be easily cast into shape and replaced by a single person or at least a smaller team in the case of a very large wheel. Smaller wheels are better for going fast while larger wheels are better for going over bigger bumps. And since we're not interested in speed, let's go with big steel wheels, easily manufactured and replaced. Like the big, beautiful cast steel wheels seen on World War I artillery pieces. Okay, but we still haven't found a major size constraint, a determining factor. If we are to find a constraint, it will likely be in the manufacturing process itself. All the details of which are impossible for me to work out on my own. But I think the most realistic answer is that we start with human sized vehicles, akin to the excavators we use today. Larger than a truck, but much smaller than a Belaz, because your very first manufacturing line will be set up by humans. Or at least by robots made by humans. So regardless of the actual level of human involvement, our starting position is human centric, just like vehicles here on Earth. Once you've progressed down the lunar development path and can afford to expand and reinvest in a larger facility, then you can make larger and larger vehicles approaching those of the Belaz. But for our purposes today, let's just keep it simple and say about tractor size. So the next thing to figure out is the power source. What makes this thing move? Obviously internal combustion engines are off the table since there's no hydrocarbons on the moon. But other options include using solar panels, a micronuclear reactor, solar thermal engines, or a battery and electric motor, like modern electric vehicles. What we really need to pay attention to here is power density, and a nuclear reactor would offer the most. But each unit would need to be manufactured on Earth, at least in the near term, and shipped in. Even though the moon does have fissile material, it's going to be a while before a lunar enrichment plant and reactor assembly line is built considering how much would be involved in such an undertaking, and even then we'll need these excavators to build those facilities in the first place, so it's sort of putting the cart before the horse. And if you're using nuclear reactors in general, you're best off powering the entire base with them and using a battery to recharge these vehicles on the nuclear powered grid. This is because even micro nuclear reactors will need a very large array of radiators since atmospheric conduction is non-existent on the moon. With solar panels, we would need a large array as well. So why would we have panels on the vehicle itself? Why not just recharge a battery powered vehicle from a solar powered grid? Thermal engines, namely Stirling engines, are already a part of the nuclear option as that which turns the generated heat into electricity. And a solar thermal engine is really just a variant of photovoltaic panels, but with extra steps between sunlight and electricity. Photovoltaics turn sunlight directly into electricity but a solar thermal engine would use lenses and reflectors to concentrate sunlight onto the hot end of such an engine, which would then drive a generator. So all paths lead to batteries, at least in this given context. Modern lithium ion batteries are great and they work well and they have enough power density to do tractor stuff. But unfortunately, lithium is quite rare on the moon at only 10 parts per million. Not rare, though, is aluminum, calcium, and magnesium. However, these kinds of battery chemistries still require some investigation to address issues such as volume expansion, passivation, and self-corrosion. But sodium ion batteries work today. 
While less abundant than aluminum, calcium, and magnesium, sodium is present in significant quantities on the moon at about 5,000 parts per million in the Maria regions, which is yet another reason to establish a base there, rather than the poles. This is in addition to this area's relative flatness, aiding in landing and landscaping, as well as the regolith containing not just higher sodium, but also higher iron content as well. Sodium batteries do have a lower energy density than lithium ion batteries, but it's not a deal breaker. Lithium batteries yield between 120 to 260 watt hours a kilogram, while sodium batteries yield between 75 to 160 watt hours a kilogram. And then there are several different variations of battery chemistry under the sodium ion umbrella. I'm getting a lot of this info from this awesome study published in the American Chemical Society's Energy Journal, which I'll link in the description, but generally, these variations of sodium batteries are a no-go on the moon because they require fluorine and vanadium, which are pretty rare on the moon. That leaves us with these chemistry variations using more common elements. The authors also note that elements with greater abundance can be incorporated as dopants that improve performance. For example, aluminum and titanium doping has been shown to improve stability, rate capability, and cycling performance in this specific chemistry variant, which is the author's way of gently nudging the audience in a certain direction while still appearing to remain neutral like subtly nodding towards your favorite child without the others realizing. And then the authors talk about making the negative electrode from carbon recycled from waste packaging, which is much more polite than astronaut poop, but that's why they publish in the ACS while I make YouTube videos. And finally, for the liquid electrolyte, my lazy ass is just gonna read from the paper directly. Quote, sodium hexafluorophosphate appears as the most promising option for lunar battery manufacturing due to the greater availability of its component materials, particularly in the Maria region of the moon. Nonetheless, sodium hexafluorophosphate could only be obtained through a complex multi-step synthesis, while scarcer sodium perchlorate could be obtained through a simple synthesis involving recycling. So we have our batteries. But what about the thing that actually turns electricity into work? As for the actual electric motor itself, well, modern electric motors rely heavily on copper, and unfortunately copper seems to be quite scarce on the moon, at only 60 parts per million. Fortunately, you can actually make electric motors using any conductive metal, not just copper. But if the metal has lower conductivity than copper, higher resistance, like aluminum, then you would need bigger wire to maintain the same performance. This would lead to either bigger motors for the same performance or less efficient motors. Aluminum has been used in motors before, but it is quite rare. However, some people argue we should transition to using aluminum motors even here on Earth given how much more abundant it is than copper, making it much cheaper. And they argue that the increased size of an aluminum motor, which would be about 25% larger than a copper one, would be offset by the fact that aluminum weighs 50% less than copper, so the motor would be lighter overall. Regardless of whether substituting copper with aluminum is a good idea here on Earth or not, given there's basically no copper or silver on the moon, but tons of aluminum as it would be one of the byproducts of our steel making process, we can just make larger, lighter aluminum motors to actually convert our electricity into work. And that leads us to the final thing we need to figure out, which is how to actually work this thing. How does this thing dig? I think the best approach is to use cables and pulleys like these old steam shovels. This is where we go back in time. Modern excavators and heavy machines use hydraulics, and in my mass driver video, I argued that a company should start looking into developing hydraulic systems that will work in the lunar environment. The logic was that hydraulics are useful and necessary for heavy machinery, but we don't have much experience with hydraulics on the moon because during Apollo, NASA avoided using them because they feared the regolith would interfere with their function and didn't want that to be a potential failure point. And since they weren't reusing their vehicles, they could afford to ignore that and just go with single-use designs such as crush canister suspension on the limb. So if we want to make vehicles, lunar hydraulics makes sense, right? That was the logic. 
But since then, I've come to learn a lot more about hydraulic systems, and I believe when compared to a pulley operated system, the downsides to hydraulic systems begin to stack heavily in favor of a pulley and cable operated system. Hydraulic oil gels below negative 30 degrees Celsius, and the lunar night drops down to negative 133 degrees Celsius. They also shouldn't be used above 70 degrees Celsius and the lunar day reaches positive 121 degrees Celsius. So any hydraulic systems are immediately made more complicated by needing both a cooling and radiating system, plus a sleeve or cover to keep the regolith out. Now, this is fine, we can do this, we can design this, and it might be worth it if not for the final fact that I think breaks the hydraulic camel's back, and that is the complete absence of oil on the moon, which is why the US hasn't gone back since the oil supply shocks of the 1970s. Technically, hydraulics can use any fluid, but there's basically no fluids on the moon in general, not just oil, and any liquid water or sulfur will have higher priority uses elsewhere. This means each hydraulic system we make will need to use oil imported from Earth. A mid-sized excavator uses about 130 liters of hydraulic fluid, and if we round that up to 200 liters, then a 200 ton capable super heavy rocket could deliver enough fluid for a thousand vehicles. That's a lot, but it's also expensive. Why should we do this when we can just use an alternative system? There are lots of viable alternatives to hydraulics, not just cables and pulleys, from pneumatic pumps to electric actuators, and I don't know which is best but I favor a cable and pulley system because they are easy to manufacture and repair and can be made entirely out of lunar resources. If you're worried about power, yes, cable and pulley systems are less powerful than modern hydraulics, but power depends more on the size of the vehicle itself. Everything else is marginal. Not to mention the Panama Canal was excavated using cable and pulley operated machines and were operating in less gravity so good enough is good enough. Now, the last thing we need to discuss are the computers, the cameras, and the comms, the navigation systems for these vehicles, which again will be operated either remotely or autonomously, and unfortunately, like nuclear reactors, it's likely going to be a very long time before cameras and computers can be manufactured on the moon, so we will need to import these things for every vehicle for the foreseeable future. But luckily these are pretty lightweight, so we can get a lot of vehicles worth per lunar launch. How much exactly? I have no clue. But do I really need to explain how lightweight and compact modern electronics are? What percentage of a modern car's weight is made up of electronics? I'd wager it's less than 1%, but if you actually know the correct value, please let me know in the comments, I'm interested. All right, so putting everything together, we've got a steel, wheeled, cable and pulley operated, sodium battery, aluminum motor powered digging machine. A steamless steam shovel. A, uh, a sodium shovel. So yes, I am proposing that a 200 year old design for a steam driven machine be revived to develop the moon in the 21st century. But really, what we've created is a basis for many different vehicles, not just an excavator. The ingredients and approach are laid out. With this strategy, we can make excavators and flatbed haulers, open-topped hoppers, bulldozers, and cranes, all made out of solid, simple steel components. We think we will develop the moon using a fleet of super-advanced vehicles because we reference modern rovers but those were designed to be transported via a rocket. But if we're doing anything at scale, we need to put a premium on simple, robust uses of NC2 resources. Again, we are essentially bootstrapping a civilization from scratch. The more complex and involved a production process is, the more imports we'll need to manufacture it or to set up its production line. But we don't have to restart our developmental process from the Stone Age, from the Flintstones, but neither does it make sense to set up modern Ferrari manufacturing lines. And just to be clear, I'm not saying we can't make Ferraris on the moon, I'm saying we shouldn't, at least not for a long time. And it's worth noting that if the moon was somehow magically covered in hydrocarbons, then we might consider using those instead of steel as our main material, and the optimal path of development might look very different. 
combustion powered plastic vehicles or something. But since the moon is covered in iron, not oil, sodium shovels it is. And while we're on the topic of antiquated machines, I wanted to point out how much of the Allies' success in World War II came from taking a similar strategy to what we're doing on the moon, in that instead of trying to make super weapons like the Germans, trying to make the perfect tank at the cost of time and expense, the Americans and Russians went the opposite route in mass producing tons of medium quality standardized designs that were easily repaired and, if not repaired, were generally expendable. This strategy is most commonly encapsulated in the idea that it took five Shermans to take out a single Tiger tank. But this is really just because Shermans traveled in groups of five at all times, so every time a Tiger tank was taken out, five Shermans were present. A more interesting case, I think, is the American Willy Jeep, which was made to fit into a crate so that it could be airdropped to a squad who was trained and able to assemble the entire Jeep from the box in about four minutes. And since the Jeeps themselves were made of mostly steel and simple parts, they rarely broke down and were known to be very, very reliable. When they did break, they were easily repairable, which is why they were used by the US military as late as the 1980s. When people claim things used to be made better, that's because things, even common household appliances, were made from steel with straightforward, simple designs. Everyone could repair the stuff around their house, but they rarely needed to because it rarely broke. I mean, we've all probably heard about sewing machines and vacuums from the 1950s still working far better than the new ones today. Why did we quit making things this way? When did we trade quality and convenience for cost? Why is everything designed to break? How did we get to the point where planned obsolescence is the norm? Now nobody knows how to repair anything because nothing is designed for repair. It's designed to break. Planned complexity planned fragility. Today, the ability to build, to repair, to create is gatekept by greedy corporate monopolies who want to deny you your right to repair, to make you dependent on specialists, to rob you of your basic autonomy, to castrate you and make you lame. Because they know an empowered people, a handy people possessing the ability to build, fed up with the bullshit, might go haymire building machines to just demolish it all, to tear it all down and rebuild anew. Creative destruction. Komatsu construction. We also need a lunar bulldozer. I almost forgot. You see, that sodium shovel excavator we've just designed will be great for digging holes, which is necessary for building habitable structures and whatnot. But for gathering regolith to make steel, in general, it makes sense to just scrape copious quantities from across the lunar surface. In other words, we want to strip mine about 30 centimeters deep across vast areas to fuel our ever-growing lunar economy. And look at this, the first bulldozer was just a horse pulled pushing thing. No pulleys or hydraulics required. The first engine powered bulldozers were just blades put onto the front of tractors. They used cables and pulleys to lift the blade up and down just like the steam shovels. So we can totally do the same, just add a blade to our excavator so it can dig and doze like modern back hoes. Later, as the scale of our operation increases, it might make more sense to build specialized vehicles. Maybe you want to optimize the dozer for travel distance. Then you can create a bulldozer using the same basic principles we used to create the excavator. A steel wheeled sodium powered blade pusher. And I suppose the last thing we need is a truck or something to carry all that gathered regolith back to the smelters and an open topped hopper would work perfectly fine. And there we have it, a fleet of mass produced heavy machinery which you can use to conquer the heavens. Their color doesn't matter but I'm going to paint them yellow for the thumbnail. 
Something I really want to do with this channel is use these videos as a way to crowdsource scrutiny. These are big problems we are trying to figure out, and 10,000 brains are better than one. So let me know in the comments if you have good ideas, feedback, or if I missed something. I'm just one little human brain trying to tackle all this, which really requires a team of experts and researchers, so I don't want my ideas to be taken as definitive. I'm an explorer. I deliver concepts, not finished products, so take what I say with a grain of sodium ions. Anyway, the next video should be on manufacturing and or mining, where we'll look at not only putting these things to use, but using these machines to create more of themselves. Kind of. Okay, that might be two to three videos down the line, but we'll get there. And as always, thank you for watching, and thank you to the patron and channel members who made this video possible. Please consider supporting the channel, stay tuned, and I'll see y'all soon.